We're at Boosom Hall, deep in the forest of Boland. What a gorgeous building. If this room could talk, it would tell you some amazing stories of ghosts, murders and mysteries. But we're getting towards Christmas, and of course we always associate Christmas with ghost stories. Let's now turn the clock back to 1642. That's when the English Civil War started, and quite simply those people who wished to fight for the King were known as Royalists, and those people who wished to fight for Parliament were known as Parliamentarians. Here at Brewsham Hall, the Parker family wished to remain on the side of the King. But not too far from here, a gentleman called Gilbert de Horton formed a huge army from the Fylde Coast and set off to take the town of Blackburn, about seven miles from here. They were very, very well equipped and they got to a place called Duke Sprow, overlooking the town of Blackburn. There they opened fire on the town and cannonball after cannonball rained down into Blackburn, sending shrapnel in each direction. The town of Blackburn was very, very fortunate to have two really good parliamentarian generals, uh, General Starkey and General Shuttleworth, and they formed a ring of defence around Blackburn. They kept their men's heads below the parapets of the trenches to protect them from this cannonball barrage. And then the cannonball barrage just stopped, and on Duke's brow a huge argument was taking place between Sir Gilbert Horton and his men. Sir, we don't mind dying for you, sir. We don't mind dying for the King, sir, but not... Not on Christmas Eve, sir. We should be with our families, sir, on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, sir. Attack Blackman now! Attack Blackman now! shouted Horton. They about turned and set off, leaving huge amounts of ammunition and equipment on top of Duke's brow. Shuttleworth and Starkey thought, they're retreating, we can, we can head them off at the top of Duke's brow. And they met the rear guard of Gilbert's army. An exchange of fire took place and quite a few deaths took place that Christmas Eve in 1642. We now pick at the story in 1995, when a lady who lives on Duke's Brow runs a very successful guest house. She had seven children, they all went to university, all left home, and she couldn't bear to leave the ancestral home, so therefore she turned it into a little hotel, a and b uh, in the summer of 1995, she was digging in her vegetable patch, an area she'd not dug over for many years. And as she put the fork into the soil, she turned the soil over and up came a cannonball, followed by musket balls and shrapnel, a spur. She'd heard about the Battle of Duke's Brow and realised that these items did come from that period. She put the items in a seed tray and then went into the guest house. The telephone rang. On the end of the telephone was an Australian. Uh, have you got a room for me wife and three kids? We're going to come over the Sarvo. Yes, of course I have. Right, we'll see you this afternoon. The Australian family arrived and she said, just go to the front room. I'll make you a nice cup of tea. As she put the kettle on, she heard hysterical shouting and screaming and the Australian family came rushing down the corridor and elbowed her to the side. She was quite shocked as they jumped into their car and reversed at great speed out of her driveway. She told her husband, Oh, don't worry, love. Australians, very strange people. But she was very, very upset. She thought, has my cat made a mess in there? She went into the front room and found her settee on the side, a lampshade on the floor, a picture hanging awkwardly. Uh, that night, she got a telephone call from Ambleside in Cumbria, from the same Australian. I'm so sorry about leaving your house in such a hurry. I should think so. What's wrong? Ah, oh, my wife's just got over it. Those three soldiers came for the wall, right from my wife and three daughters, right through them. Soldiers? Yes, yeah, soldiers. Bandleys across the chest, gaudy beards. Right for me wife and three kids. Well, thanks for telling me, she said. She'd heard about the Battle of Duke's Brown, and it wasn't long before the local newspaper heard about it as well. And then the national press came on board, and two doctors from York University arrived and talked to her. And they said, you've had what's called the Martindale Syndrome. Martindale Syndrome, she said. Yes, way back in 1952, a young lad called Harry Martindale was working in the treasurer's house at York Minster. He was in a cellar when he heard the sound of a trumpet and out of the wall appeared a white horse with a Roman soldier on it, followed by platoon after platoon of Roman soldiers. Um, he could only see them to their knees. The last Roman soldier went past him and disappeared from the wall and the trumpet sound followed him. He rushed upstairs and told his boss. His boss said, no, get back down there, lad. We've got to get this job done. I can't. You're sacked. He made his way for the city of York and popped into an old inn called the Old Star Inn. At the bar, by some strange coincidence, was a young lad from the York Evening Press who said, hey, you look like you've seen a ghost, mate. 
Actually, I've seen 35 of them, said young Harry. Go on, tell me about it. He told about the whole story. And uh, the story was printed. And the whole city of York laughed at young Harry. But a week later, no one did. Because some more work had to take place in the treasurer's house. They removed a lot of soil. And they came across this Roman floor. And they found a large Roman stone with the words... Eberarchum. They'd found the garrison of York, exactly where these soldiers would have gone in and out of the barracks. He described the soldiers as being very, very thin, very emaciated, and slightly dark-skinned. And many people believe that what Harry did that day, he opened a time warp into another era, another time. And the soldiers he saw could have been the 9th Hispanic Legion leaving the city of York and making their way to Carlisle, where they were wiped out by the Celts and the whole legion was wiped out. Well, we go back to Blackburn, and these two doctors told about Harry, and they said, when you dug over the vegetable patch, and you brought up the cannonball and the shrapnel, you were the very, very first person since 1642 to actually touch those items, and you opened a time warp into an era and another time. And who knows, perhaps that's what ghosts could be from another era and another time. It's been a real pleasure to tell this story in front of this roaring fire here in this gorgeous building, Brusom Hall, in the heart of the Forest of Boland. Thank you. <laughs>